So broadly speaking, former President Donald Trump has followed two strategies as he defends himself against the 91 felony criminal charges he's facing right now. His first strategy is delay, 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 delay. Delay it long enough, who knows, maybe Trump becomes president again in the middle of all this and somehow makes all the cases go away. So that's his first and most important strategy, delay. Second strategy is claim immunity. Tell the courts that he can't be prosecuted because he was president at the time of his alleged crimes. Well, today, those two strategies came together in a surprising and urgent way. The news comes from the criminal case against Trump that's pending in Washington, D.C. federal court. That's where Trump is now trying to make his immunity argument with a fresh appeal to the federal appeals court in D.C., the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, just a few days ago. Now, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals should be on your radar, uh, in part because they spent almost an entire year considering the single question of whether Trump could be held civilly liable for his behavior as president around the January 6th attack. It took them ages and ages and ages to rule on that. 11 months and 25 days. They were really in no hurry. And yes, they ruled that Trump could be held civilly liable. It went against him, but it took them a year. And remember, any delay is a win for Trump. So in the criminal case, a slow-moving D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals is a huge danger to the prospect of Trump actually getting into court and being tried anywhere near his trial date any time before the presidential election. So this new move by special counsel Jack Smith today, he's decided to try to go around the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. He petitioned the Supreme Court to just take the case directly, to hurry the process up, to skip the appeals court, in effect. And this is one thing worth noting. The petition to the Supreme Court was co-signed by this special counsel, counsel of record, Michael Dreeben. You recognize that name? Michael Dreeben is a prosecutor who served in the Solicitor General's office at DOJ for over three decades. He has argued more than 100 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. You can imagine why Jack Smith might have wanted to add this guy to this part of this case. Well, tonight, the Supreme Court has responded and said they're going to fast track consideration of whether or not to hear this case. They've ordered Donald Trump to respond by next week, by Wednesday, December 20th. Joining us now is Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney in the Northern District of Alabama. Joyce, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Rachel. Did I understand that correctly? Did I explain any of that the wrong way around? No, I think you got it just right. Michael Dreeben is the former deputy solicitor general who had responsibility for criminal. That makes him a great pick for this case. Now, Joyce, I know that you worked with Mr. Dreeben. Um, you know him professionally from all your years in, fe in federal law enforcement. What should we understand about him other than that line on his resume in terms of um, his, his skills, what he brings to this, and, and why Jack Smith might be using him in this way for this part of this case? Right. So mere U.S. attorneys, the job that I once held, have to go to the Solicitor General for permission anytime the government wants to take an appeal in a criminal case. Dreeben was in charge of, of making those decisions, and that means he's considered every sort of criminal appellate situation that could come up. This writ that you're talking about, Rachel, the writ for, for judgment before the Court of Appeals has considered a case, this isn't something that's commonly used. It's not something that even appellate practitioners are widely familiar with. This is the sort of strategy that you get when you come to someone like Dreeben. And understanding that Trump's strategy is one of delay, you know, now this is Jack Smith's moment where with his new appellate counsel at the table, he's saying, I feel the need for speed, and this is the way to get it. And Joyce, for, forgive me the, the ignorance um, that is at the heart of this question, but as a non-lawyer, it's my impression um, that it only requires four of the nine justices to agree to this type of petition, to agree to consider this case. Is, is that right? And, and why would they only need a minority? Yes, you need four votes to hear the case. This is pretty standard across appellate courts. It takes fewer votes to get a case heard than it takes to win it. Hmm. So that's how the process is set up. In terms of what's likely to happen here, um, if you had to, you know, looking at the, the composition of this court, looking at what we know about Smith's case, looking at Mr. Dreeben helming this part of the case, what do you expect to happen in the Supreme Court and over what kind of a time frame? So, look, it's, it's tough to predict these things. We both know that. 
But at bottom in this matter is Trump's argument that former presidents are above the law. Hmm. I don't think the Supreme Court can accept or let stand that sort of a ruling. The Supreme Court has to decide this case. It's what lawyers call an issue of first impression. No court has ever determined whether a former president has immunity for the rest of his life for anything he did while he was president that might be criminal. So there needs to be a decision. But I think that there will be a majority of this court, even if it's a slender one, that will say that criminal prosecution can continue. And, and the way we know that Dreeben is a great lawyer to argue this case is the way he's framed this petition already, appealing to the core issues that we know this court is very concerned with. The history, the structure, the language of the law is, is what he's already raised, saying that this is an issue that goes to the heart of democracy. It's fundamental to the future. I think he'll position this case to make it very attractive for the court to rule in Jack Smith's favor. Joyce Vance, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. Clarion, as always, it's great to have you here, Joyce. Thanks. You guys, we are almost the best ever. We almost have the record. The record, the all-time American record for the least productive year in Congress in the history of the Congress is from when Herbert Hoover was president, the last year of his presidency, uh, 1931 to 1932. America was in the throes of the Great Depression. At that point, the unemployment rate was still climbing from horrific to even more horrific. That Congress from March 1931 to March 1932 passed a grand total of 21 bills that were signed into law over the course of the whole year. That's the lowest of any year in Congress ever. And that year, Congress actually waited nine months before ever convening a single session in Washington. They basically took the first nine months of the year off. So all 21 of the bills that Congress passed that entire year were passed in just the last three months. And that is the record, the nadir, the all-time low in terms of congressional history, just 21 laws passed in a whole year. That's the record. We're so close. This week officially marks the end of this Congress's first full year. The number of bills passed by this Congress and signed into law so far is 22. We're so close, you guys. This Congress has managed to just barely beat the absolute worst record set by any Congress in history. A Congress which, again, only met for three months of that year. We are almost as bad as it gets. So close. They've passed 22 laws total. One of them was to establish a new commemorative coin, and two of them were to rename medical clinics. That said, this Congress has set some records of its own. This is the first Congress to have a Speaker of the House ousted by members of his own party. This Congress has also passed more censure resolutions than any Congress since 1870. They have censured more of their own members than any Congress since the invention of the light bulb. That's something. Now to top off this remarkable year, Republicans are looking to close things out by voting to open a new impeachment inquiry into President Biden, despite the fact that Republicans have yet to find anything to actually impeach President Biden for. They're just going to kind of open-ended impeach him and hope something emerges while they're voting. What Republicans have done to this Congress on, on the one level is hilarious, but on another level, it is a little bit disturbing. Um, if you could step back from it, if you can, like, the schadenfreude, if you could just, um, I mean, at a more serious level, when a democracy starts sliding into an authoritarian form of government, one of the things you see is the erosion of all government power, all government authority, uh, other than, you know, il duce, other than the leader, other than the executive. So the legal system, the judiciary comes under attack or gets undercut or weakened or, or, or closed down or co-opted. You see that happen to the judiciary. You also see it happen to the legislature, right? Because in an authoritarian system, you can't have a parliament or a, or a Congress, a legislature that has any real authority to, that could compete with the authority of the dear leader. That's the whole idea of the authoritarian system, right? Unified authority in one person, and that person is effectively the government. 
There's a reason nobody ever talks about like what bills are being passed in the Russian legislature, right? Nobody's hanging on what happens in the Duma anymore because it's essentially been domesticated, weakened, and rendered irrelevant by the fact that they have a dictatorship. It matters whether or not you have branches of government. Abrogating the authority and responsibilities of a branch of government is not just dumb and pitiful and sometimes inadvertently funny. It is also sometimes an important part of losing your democracy. It is part of the anti-democratic authoritarian project. This Congress is pitiful. We also need America to have a Congress. This Congress still has one more year left. Perhaps they will decide to try to make it count. In the Trump presidency, Republicans finally succeeded in their machinations to stack the U.S. Supreme Court with hardline anti-abortion conservatives, and then they were able to get through the policy they most wanted. They overturned Roe versus Wade, and that allowed Republican-controlled states all over the country to ban abortion. And even those bans have not been enough for Republicans in, in many states. Republicans are now proposing in the state of Missouri, for example, that abortion be charged as homicide that abortion be charged criminally as murder. Republicans in the Missouri House and the Missouri Senate are now proposing murder charges for abortion in legislation that they are bringing up this month. This comes after Republicans have proposed similar legislation in Kentucky and in Georgia and in Arkansas and in South Carolina and in Colorado. Republicans in all of those states have proposed murder charges for abortion, which usually, of course, means life in prison or even the possibility of capital punishment. In Ohio, a young woman is newly facing criminal charges for having had a miscarriage at home. They're bringing criminal charges against her, threatening her with prison for the handling of the fetal remains after she miscarried at home. And in Texas, the case of 31-year-old Kate Cox has played out over these last few days as a Republican fantasy of how they would most like to wield really, 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 really big government. Kate Cox is a mother of two. She's 31 years old. She very much has wanted a third child. She was pregnant with that third child when she learned that it would not be a viable pregnancy, a fatal genetic abnormality. She had already been in and out of the hospital with fairly serious complications in this pregnancy. Her doctor advised her that if she wants to be able to try again, if she and her husband want to try to get pregnant again, to try for another child, which they desperately want, this non-viable pregnancy must be ended by abortion in order to protect her health and potentially to save her life. But Texas bans abortion because Texas is a Republican-controlled state. So Kate Cox had to go to court to try to get an exception from Texas's abortion ban. And a Texas judge ruled late last week that she could have an exception from the abortion ban. She could get this abortion in this special case to preserve her health, to potentially preserve her own life. The Texas Republican Attorney General responded by writing to, to Kate Cox's doctor and to the Texas hospitals where the doctor has admitting privileges, the Texas Attorney General threatening that he would potentially criminally prosecute them if they did the abortion, regardless of that Texas court ruling. He then filed an appeal with the Texas Supreme Court. The Texas Supreme Court only has Republican judges on it. And that all-Republican Supreme Court in Texas promptly agreed to hear the appeal. That stayed the lower court ruling. The practical effect of that is that Kate Cox was once again legally blocked from being able to get an abortion in Texas. And then the Supreme Court just sat on it and did nothing. They blocked the ruling allowing her abortion on Friday, and then they just sat on it all weekend and today. Who knows when they would have got around to finally making some sort of decision about it. She's already 20 weeks pregnant, right? She's been in and out of the emergency room at least four times with complications from this pregnancy, but no rush, guys. Today, Ms. Cox's legal counsel, the Center for Reproductive Rights, announced that Ms. Cox finally was effectively forced to flee. She left the state to go to some safer place where there isn't a ban like this one that Republicans have imposed in Texas. Nancy Northup, the chief executive for the Center for Reproductive Rights, which has been representing Ms. Cox in this case, said this. She said, quote, Kate desperately wanted to be able to get care where she lives and recover at home surrounded by family. While Kate had the ability to leave the state, most people do not. And a situation like this 
could be a death sentence. That was this afternoon. And now tonight, hours after that announcement from the Center for Reproductive Rights, hours after we learned that Kate Cox had to leave the state of Texas so she could get this abortion somewhere else, Tonight, the Texas Supreme Court has nevertheless just issued its ruling in this case. They ruled that the lower court was wrong to give Kate Cox an exception to the ban. They ruled that Kate Cox effectively should have been forced by the government of the state of Texas to carry this pregnancy to term of a baby that would not live, despite the fact that doing so would risk her health, would risk her ability to ever have a child again, and potentially, potentially even risk her death. A government would compel that of her and her body. While the Republican attorney general threatened criminal prosecution of anyone who helped her in a state where the penalty for helping a woman in this circumstance is up to 99 years in prison. Because, you know, limited government, freedom. Joining us now is Nancy Northup, president and CEO of the Center for Reproductive Rights. The group that's been representing Kate Cox in her case against the state of Texas. Ms. Martha, thanks very much for being here. Good evening. Thank you for covering this. Did I get any of that wrong? No, unfortunately, you got it all right. I mean, just imagine as you went through what Kate went through this week. First, she had a terrible diagnosis. Then she had to go to court, plead in front of the court, you know, in front of the world, right? Because it's on video to get basic health care. The judge rules that she can, and yet, as you pointed out, Attorney General Paxton says, no, you know, I'm threatening your doctors, I'm threatening the hospitals, and eventually she has to flee the state, as she did today. I mean, we're at the point in the United States where we have reproductive freedom states and we have reproductive oppression states, and one has to flee an oppression state to be able to get basic health care. But that's what Kate has gone through this week. It is unacceptable. But that is what we're living with in post-Roe America. I know that um, Ms. Cox has left the state of Texas seeking care elsewhere. I'm not going to ask you, obviously, to disclose anything about the circumstances of where she is or what she had to do. But can you tell us if she's okay? She's okay. She's had a really, really devastating time. I mean, as you pointed out, all weekend long, waiting and hoping that the Texas Supreme Court would rule that she could go ahead, as the district court ruled, having heard the medical evidence, mm. that she could have the abortion in the state of Texas to preserve her health, to preserve her future fertility. And despite all that, that ruling did not come. It is just simply devastating. What do you make of the ruling that they issued tonight? I did not know if the case would be considered moot and they would decide that they didn't have to rule once your office had announced that she had left the state and was obtaining the procedure elsewhere. They nevertheless decided to rule. Was that definitely going to happen either way? Do you have a reaction to their ruling? I mean, the ruling did not give any more clarity and guidance to doctors about when they can perform abortions in the state of Texas. So we're right back into the place that we have been for a very long time. Courts not giving guidance. The state's medical board's not giving guidance. And Attorney General Ken Paxton is running around telling everybody that nothing qualifies under their exception. It also just shows how these medical, you know, health exceptions yeah. that these states pass saying, oh, no, we're compassionate. We have these health exceptions. They don't mean anything because nobody can access them. This is, this is a difficult question. And please tell me if I'm off base in asking it. But given what Attorney General Ken Paxton did here after that initial court ruling in Texas, going to the doctors, going to the hospitals where the doctor had admiss admission practice, admit admitting privileges and, and threatening criminal prosecution of anybody who helped Ms. Cox and her family in this case. Is it possible that Ms. Cox and her husband could face like civil suits or, or charges? Are they potentially liable as Texas residents for somebody like Pat Ken Paxton coming after them, even though they had to leave the state to get this done? They absolutely should not be. We have a right to travel in this country. You have a right to go to another state and get health care and be under the laws of that state. So that would be extreme intimidation, and it would be a misuse of the prosecutorial authority of the state of Texas. But, you know, let's, let's hope that does not happen. And people should know you can go to a reproductive freedom state and get health care that you need. How does this case, I understand this is the, 
or correct me if I'm wrong, was this the first time that somebody has had to seek a court-ordered exception to an abortion ban? Was this the first time? I think post Dobbs' decision, post yeah. the reversal of Roe versus Wade, it was.